What's up guys, Laura Whitmore here, owner of Strategic Test Prep, and I'm back today with another video to walk you through another part of the March 2023 SAT test. And I took this test, you guys, a few weeks ago and scored a perfect 800 on the math, so I'm really excited to show you how to do some of these questions on section four. Now, if you're prepping for another test coming up, let's say the May or the June, this is a great video for you to watch because math concepts get recycled over and over on the SAT, and I think there's a really good chance a lot of this stuff is going to be tested again on those upcoming tests. So that being said, I have this really awesome SAT self-directed course. If you want a more structured prep plan and you want to get prepared for this upcoming test in May or in June, you have the perfect amount of time to prep and you can go at your own pace. There are six modules. They cover all sections of the test and there's exclusive video content that's not available on YouTube in there. So I will link that up here and down in the description. I would go sign up as soon as possible so you can get prepping because you're going to need some time to get ready for the next test that you take. All right, so as far as the walkthrough is concerned, I don't want to do the whole section four because that would take a long time. And honestly, you guys, some of the questions at the beginning of the section are pretty basic. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start in what I call the danger zone. So let's just get started. I'm going to look at this number 23. And why don't we read that just so you guys can remember what they're asking. So it says f of x equals 0.28x minus 2.9. Okay, immediately I'm already thinking linear function, slope is 0.28, y-intercept is negative 2 point, or yeah, negative 2.9. All right, so it says the f the function f models the length in centimeters. Okay, so I'm going to just label that f of x is the length in centimeters. And then um, x is the seed mass. So I'm going to label that in milligrams. Okay. Now they're saying that the seed mass in milligrams is anywhere from 68 milligrams to 80 milligrams, according to this. So which of the following is a graph of the model? Okay. So as you can see, and I, let me blow this up a little bit so you guys can really see these graphs. Um, we do have a domain from 68 to 80. So those all look pretty good. Now it's a positive slope. So immediately I'm going to get rid of C. And if I was playing majority rules, I'd probably go between A and B because they look so similar. D looks crazy. The, um, the slope looks very aggressive for a slope that's only supposed to be 0.28. So I'm going to get rid of D. And then honestly, at this point, I think we should just choose a point and test it. So, um, Let's see, let's pick a point. So it looks like um, it's either at 2580 or at 2080. So I'm just gonna go ahead and I'm going to test it at 2080 and see what happens. So if I put in 80, basically, do I get 20 or 25? That's really all we have to do. So at this point, you know, we've got to get out the calculator, but that's okay. So 0.28 times 80 is 22.4, you write that down, minus 2.9, and we get 19.5. So basically when X is 80, I'm closer to nine or to 20 than I am to 25, so I'm gonna go with A. Okay, next problem, 24. So it's the same question, they're just, or the same um, content, they're just asking a different question. So they want us to interpret the linear equation. What is the best interpretation of 0.28 in this context? <clears throat> well, it's a slope. So first of all, I don't think it would ever be a max mass or max shoot length because maximum usually deals with quadratics and this is linear. So with linear equations, actually it's infinite. It goes on to positive infinity, negative infinity. I don't know if there would be a max here. I'm just gonna get rid of those. Those seem funky to me. Okay. Now, C says for every two seedlings with one centimeter difference in shoot lengths, the estimated difference in the masses of the seeds is 0.28 milligrams. And then D says for every two seeds with one milligram difference in masses, the estimated difference in shoot lengths is 0.28 centimeters. Now, the question is, what are we putting in for X? Well, if we look at the other question above, X is in milligrams, you guys. Remember I labeled that? This is why I would suggest you always annotate on your functions. If you've never seen the equation before, take little notes. 
X is in milligrams. So when we go ahead and we put something into this equation here, it's going to be in milligrams. So it's going to be a one milligram increase will increase it that much. It has nothing to do with um, increasing at one centimeter. It's really increasing it um, by milligrams. So we're going to go with D. All right, next one, 25. Okay, we have values and frequencies. Now, sometimes these tables get a little wonky once they upload them into collegeboard.org. So I'm just going to go ahead and divide these up so we can see them a little bit better. Which statement best compares the medians of the two data sets? Okay, well, it looks like each data set has two, six, seven, eight, nine. Okay, they have nine numbers. So the fifth number in the data sets is going to be the median because the fifth number is really right in the middle. So my frequency tells me how many values there are or of each thing. So I have one value of three. I could, this could, sometimes tables get confusing for students. I wouldn't personally solve it this way because I already know how to do this. But if you get confused by frequency tables, I would write out every value so that they're in ascending order like you typically have seen data in the past when you've done stats problems. So you have the value of three one time, you have the value of four zero times, you have the value of five two times, the value of six four times, and the value of seven two times. So it looks like the middle number is right here. So the median of this set is six. Now, when you go ahead and you list out the, the for data set two, the values, you've got three twice, four three times, five two times, six one time, and seven one time. So you have four in the middle in that set. So it looks like the median of data set one is greater than data set two. The answer is B. We have examining pollen in the soil. Scientists estimated that the number of Ulmus trees in an ancient population doubled every 664 years. There were N trees in the earliest known sample where N is constant. Which expression gives the estimated number of almost trees X years after the year of the earliest known sample? Well, this is the key. It doubled every 664 years. When I see the word doubled, I think exponential. So I'm looking for an exponential function with a 2 on the inside. And they have it for all of them on this. So that doesn't help us. Every 664 years means however many years you have... You have to divide by 664 because there's only one iteration every 664 years. So, for instance, if you have, let's see, what's 664 times 2? If 1,328 years go by and it only happens once every 664 years, you're really going to have two iterations. So, I need to pick C. Okay, let's go to another one, 27. So if X is greater than zero and P percent of X is 13, which expression represents 10 or represents X in terms of P? Yeah, you know what I would do? I would probably just pick numbers and use nice numbers for this to make it easy. So 10% of 130 is 13. So I would make P 10 and I would make X 130 and solve. Now they're saying which expression represents X? So that means we want an answer of 130. So I'm going to put 10 in for P until I get 130. And I actually get 130 with D because 100 times 13 divided by 10 gets me 1300 divided by 10, which is 130, which is what I needed. All right, 28. So I chose this one too because I thought that this was a really good one to cover. This was a lot like another question that they had on... Man, I don't know if it was the March SAT back in 2021, but whenever it was, a lot of my students had trouble with this. So the last time they did it, it was a frame and this time a picture frame. And now this time it's a pool. But anyways, they said that the width of the pool is 20 meters. So I'm going to write that down. This is actually the pool part, you guys. So that's 20. And then they said the length is 25. And then it's surrounded by a concrete border with a uniform width of X meters. If the combined area of the pool and the concrete border is 546 square meters, what is the value of X? Well, there's different ways you can do it. Honestly, I did it algebraically, but you could also do it using working backwards. So I'll show you how to do that. It's a cute little trick. You could um, start with A and you could try 0.5 for X. So if X was 0.5, you'd have a 0.5 on that side and a 0.5 on that side. So the new width would be sorry guys the new width would be 21 you also have a 0.5 in this direction and 0.5 in this direction so the new length would be 26 
So then you can just go, okay, is 21 by 26 546? Let's find out. 21 times 26. It is 546. It checks out. You're good to go. The answer is A. Just make sure you count it on both sides. I think where my students went wrong on the picture frame problem a couple years ago is they only counted X one time, but it's on both sides of the pool, not just one side. Shown A, E, and B, D intersect at point C. Which of the following additional pieces is not sufficient to prove that triangle ABC is similar to EDC? Okay. Parallel lines are always good. If we knew that these two lines were parallel, it's going to tell us about alternate interior angles, and we need angles to prove similarity. If we have angle, angle, which basically by default we know angle, 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 we're going to get similarity. So that is sufficient to prove it. We're going to get rid of that. Um, again, angles. So if they gave us D is equivalent to B, we already know that these two are equivalent because they're vertical angles on the other sides of C. So we have angle, angle there too. So actually B is sufficient. Now, if they said A is equal to B and D is equal to E, same thing. We're dealing with angles and the base angles basically are the same. And since these vertical angles are equal, that means those base angles are going to be equal to each other. So we have angle, angle, angle again. Usually, just, you know, as a quick hack, if they're asking you to prove similarity, you want to typically go with the answer that talks about lengths of sides, because usually when you're dealing with lengths of sides, you're getting into congruency to prove that they're exactly the same size. Similarity, they're not the same size, so lengths are irrelevant. But I say usually because they have tested before where they've showed the sides being in proportion to each other, and they've given an angle, and you can actually prove similarity as long as you have two sides that are in proportion to each other. So, but that's kind of the hard and fast rule. If there's a length one in there, it's probably not sufficient to prove similarity. All right, number 30, the area of a rectangular region is increasing at a rate of 20 square feet per hour. Which of the following is closest to this rate in square meters S per minute? Okay, now I've gone over this in another video and they continue to test this. The issue is right now they're giving us uh, conversion it, that's one dimensional. It's just meters into feet. We need square meters into square feet. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take my conversion, one meter equals 3.28 feet, and I'm gonna square both sides. So basically one square meter is gonna be whatever 3.28 squared is. So let me see what that is real quick. All right, so it's gonna be 10.7584 um, square feet. Okay, so they gave us uh, the rate. So let's start off with that. They said it's 20 square feet per one hour. I'm going to write that down. There's my unit rate. And they want it in um, square meters per second. So they want us to get to square meters per second. I'm oh, sorry, per minute. So I need meters squared per minute. Okay. So first I need to get feet into meters squared and I need to get hours into minutes. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to take my square feet and I'm going to convert it to square meters, okay? Because I've got a conversion of one square meter to 10.7584 square feet. Why did I put square meters on top and square feet on the bottom? Because I want square feet to cancel with square feet, so I'm left with square meters. I also have hours on the bottom, and I need hours to cancel with hours so that I can get it into minutes, so I'm going to do my little conversion. There's 60 minutes in an hour. So I'll put 60 minutes on top. Oh, sorry. Lied, lied. Ha ha. Just kidding. Let's do that one more time. So I'll put one hour on top. Why do I want an hour on top? Because I want hours to cancel with hours. And I'm going to put 60 minutes on the bottom. That way the hours will cancel out. And then I'll be left with square meters per minute. So I'm just going to multiply straight across. 20 times 1 times 1 is 20. And then I just need to do 10.7584 times 60, which is 645.504. And I'm just going to do a quick division. So 20 divided by 645.504. That is 0 0.03. What a lovely decimal. Isn't this fun? 03098, so I'll just say 0 0.031. They want you to round it to the nearest hundredth, so the answer to that one is A. Whew, moving on. So here's some fill-ins I chose, just a few that were some of the toughest ones to go over. 
Now, this one was kind of neat because there was a quick hack to this. They said, what is the value of 8x minus 3y? Well, I noticed, I don't know if any of you guys noticed this, that when you go to add these together, you actually get 8x minus 3y. So I just added 44 and 17 together and got 61. So the answer was 61. That question literally took me two seconds. Okay, I chose 37 as well because this one was a pretty nice, easy one, easy hack. You just have to read carefully. So they said, what is the diameter of the circle in the XY plane with this equation? Well, guys, you can interpret a circle pretty easily here. The center is at 5, 4. The radius is actually 8 because 64 is R squared. But they wanted the diameter, so you have to double the radius, and that's how you end up getting 16. Okay? 38. This was my favorite. In the given equation, k is a positive constant. The equation has exactly one real solution. What is the value of k? Well, I've gone over this in my predictions videos, so hopefully you didn't miss those. If they're talking about real solutions, that's a, and it's a quadratic because your highest exponent is a 2, that's a sign you're going to do b, use b squared minus 4ac or the discriminant. Now, in this case, if it's one solution, we want the discriminant to equal 0. So I'm going to fill in what I know. So my b is k. So I've got k squared minus 4 times 4 times 9. And that's going to equal 0. So I have k squared minus, well, 4 times 9 is 36. And then times 4 is 144. Okay, well, I need K to be 12 because then I'll get zero. So the answer was 12. All right, guys, that's it for this video. I really hoped me walking through some of those tougher problems on section four helped you think about how you're going to tackle these problems when you see them again in the future on the May test or the June test. So anyways, I'll see you guys again soon. Make sure you sign up for my course. And until then, happy prepping.